football in one form or another has been played for over 2,000 years. It first emerged as a recognisable team sport in 12th century England, and almost as soon as it had, King Edward II complained of the great noise in the city caused by hustling over large balls, and promptly jailed all the players, balls and all. Two centuries later in Renaissance Italy, another version, with 27 stylishly dressed players on either side, entertained the crowds in Florence, and on various feast days throughout the summer, still do. Even if it is a little tough on the doublet and hose. In England, by 1850, a village football match literally meant that the whole village would turn out to compete with its neighbours. It was often a little difficult to keep track of the ball. The Rose Arch acted as the goal, probably one of the prettiest in soccer history. In 1863, meeting in a London pub called the Freemasons Arms, a group of sports enthusiasts formed the Football Association, devising rules that were to turn soccer from a random free-for-all into the game we know today. Complete with streamlined teams of 11 a side, proper goalposts and nets, strict time periods of 45 minutes each way, and a tweed-jacketed referee to keep the peace, football became the most popular sport in Britain. And the ladies found it fun, too. The French were the first to see the potential of soccer as a world sport. In 1904, FIFA, or the International Federation of Football Associations, was formed, and the foundations for the World Cup were laid. But the outbreak of the First World War would pay to FIFA's ambitious plans, and they had to be shelved indefinitely. When the war ended, it took FIFA 15 years to regain many of its former members. Much of the credit is due to a 48-year-old French publisher, Jules Rime, who became the president of FIFA in 1921. He retired from the job 33 years later, aged 81. Rime was dedicated to the dream of a world soccer tournament open to every nation. It was at the soccer finals of the Olympic Games held in Paris in 1924 that Rime was given the opportunity of realizing that dream. The president of the South American Republic of Uruguay had come to Paris to see his country beat Switzerland 3-0 to become Olympic champions. Rime lost no time in suggesting to the president that Uruguay would be the perfect choice to host the first FIFA World Cup president agreed. It had taken all of 26 years for FIFA to turn their dream into reality. Four European nations decided to enter for this first World Cup. The journey to Uruguay took a grueling 14 days. On the 18th of July 1930 at the unfinished Centenary Stadium in Montevideo, the first World Cup got underway. The Europeans were guests of honor and were the first to parade in the opening ceremony. But the South Americans dominated the scene from the first kickoff. The final was between Argentina and Uruguay and caused the problem right from the start. Both teams wanted to play with their own ball. But Argentina won the toss and played with theirs. But it didn't bring them any luck. One-armed Castro made it 4-2 for the host nation. Uruguay were the first World Cup champions. In 1934, 32 countries entered for the second World Cup in Rome. With the eyes of the world focused on his country, Mussolini cunningly turned the event into a huge public relations jamboree for his fascist party. Once again, the host nation reached the final. Italy played Czechoslovakia before a vast crowd. Although hundreds of Czechs crossed the Alps to support their team, the Italians won by two goals to one. Whatever reservations FIFA had about Mussolini using the tournament for his own political purposes, there is no doubt the World Cup had proved to be a major sporting event. 
In 1938, the World Cup came to Paris. FIFA invested two million francs on the stadium and players' accommodation, and their investment paid off. Before a huge crowd, Italy met Hungary in the final and deserved their 4-2 win. For the second time, Italy carried off the coveted trophy. Once again, Europe went to war. Internationalism and everything FIFA represented was shattered. London's Arsenal Stadium was just one of the many great football grounds on both sides to be severely damaged. The World Cup was held far away from the ravages of war-torn Europe. The year was 1950. The major matches were held in the famous Maracana Stadium, which holds 205,000 people and is still the largest football stadium in the world. In many ways, it was an extraordinary competition with exciting, dynamic football. Unfortunately, India withdrew when FIFA insisted that they should wear football boots. England, with Billy Wright and Stanley Matthews in the team, reached the World Cup finals for the first time. and lost 1-0 against the United States. Nobody could quite believe it. Nearly 200,000 people turned out to watch the final between Brazil and Uruguay. Everyone expected Brazil to be victorious, but Uruguay beat them 2-1. Nobody could quite believe that either. There were mass faintings, hysterics, even suicides. A samba had been composed called Brazil the Victors. It was never played. The 1950 World Cup proved that it was the world's most important football tournament. Switzerland was the host nation in 1954. For the first time, commemorative coins were minted to mark the event, an early example of World Cup marketing. It was a first, too, for television although the coverage was only seen by a limited audience. Goal scoring reached incredible highs. 140 goals were scored in the 26 games. On a rainy Sunday, Hungary risked playing an unfit Puskas in the final against West Germany. The gamble seemed to work. Hungary scored twice in the first eight minutes. But West Germany fought back with great determination and talent. One. Two. Three. Germany had won. It was Hungary's first defeat in 30 internationals. West Germany were the new World Cup champions. The 1958 World Cup in Sweden saw the debut of a dynamic 17-year-old from Brazil. His name was Pele. And it was with brilliant goals like this that he was to become the world's first great soccer superstar. In an exciting final, host nation Sweden scored the first goal. But they were no match for the mighty Brazil, who went on to win 5-2. Pelé magic was already in evidence. At 17, he was a national hero, and Brazil, for the first time, were World Cup champions. It was scenes like these seen by the biggest international television audience to date that established Pelé as a superstar overnight. Two years before the World Cup was held in Chile, a series of earthquakes badly damaged the country's towns and cities, a problem faced by Mexico in 1985. But like the Mexicans, nothing would deter the Chileans from holding the tournament. By 1962, a magnificent new stadium was ready in Santiago. It was to be the scene of one of the most extraordinary World Cup games ever. The match between Chile and Italy, which Italy went on to win 2-0, was dubbed the Battle of Santiago. 
It took the very experienced FIFA referee, Ken Aston of England, considerable skill to stop it ending in bloodshed. This, of course, was a very difficult match for me to referee. It was a game, I think, which nobody could have enjoyed. And one would perhaps wonder why such a match as this could take place. There were a number of factors, not the least of which was the very poor reception that the Italian team received when they came onto the field. This was due to a number of factors which had built up in the days preceding the match. Other factors included the need to win at all costs that had by this time arrived in the game, the fact that the two teams were of Latin temperament, most of the crowd were of Latin temperament, and the whole situation was like a cauldron. I, of course, considered abandoning the match as being the proper course of action. The reason that I did not do this was because, quite frankly, such was the atmosphere of the game and the crowd that I feared for the safety of the players had I done that. Even Brazil, the masters of attack, became more defensive and adopted a 4-3-3 system. However, they still proved their superior skill by beating Czechoslovakia in the final 3-1. For the second time running, Brazil won the Rime Trophy. The 1966 tournament in London reached an audience of over 500 million on television. The World Cup had come of age. It was now rated as highly as the Olympics as a world-class sporting event. But the pictures coming from London told an ugly tale of violence. After these experiences in England, Pele almost gave up World Cup soccer. In the match between Brazil and Portugal, he was a marked man. Within 25 minutes of the first half, two Portuguese defenders brought him down viciously. Pele was quoted as saying afterwards, soccer has been distorted by violence. I do not want to finish my life as an invalid. The referees had a frustrating time. Rattan and the Argentinians played themselves out of the tournament with some cruel football. Many rated the final between West Germany and England as the most exciting match in any World Cup to date. Germany scored first. But England equalised. And later took the lead. but the West Germans managed to come back and in the dying seconds, equalized. Extra time was to be played. To this day, no one knows for sure whether England's third goal was a goal. Swiss referee Dienst decided that the ball crossed the line. But even from another angle, it's not clear. This goal, the fourth, gave Jeff Hurst a hat-trick. The first ever in a World Cup final. Her Majesty the Queen presented Sir Alf Ramsey's heroes with the Rene Trophy. Alf Ramsey, England's team manager, had promised the nation that England would win the Cup. And they did. As the World Cup entered the 70s, huge coverage on television put enormous pressure on the players and national teams to win at all cost. Under this pressure, passions flared and emotions ran deep, and at the receiving end were the referees. These are the World Cup referees, and were the special concern of this man. Sir Stanley Rouse, for 27 years Secretary of the Football Association of England and President of FIFA from 1961 to 1974. It was Sir Stanley who invented the diagonal system of control. The universally accepted plan to make sure that the referee and his two linesmen are in the right place at the right time to judge the action. So what makes a world-class referee? 
To find out, we looked at the lifestyles of Arnaldo Coelho of Brazil, referee of the 1982 World Cup final in Spain, and Clive Thomas, the charismatic and controversial referee from Wales. Earlier in his career, Clive got the nickname of Thomas the Book because of the high number of players he used to caution during a season. But as he became more confident, he learned to referee with a firm but light touch. An incident during this game could have got out of control. Watch how Clive handles it. In the background, a punch-up is about to develop between two players. moment that in the hands of a lesser referee could have become even more ugly. Instead, Thomas quickly establishes who's This game had all the potential of being extremely violent. A needle match between the champions of Brazil, International Inari, and the runners-up, Corinthians, in Sao Paulo. But you would never have guessed from the way Coelho refereed it. His warnings were short and sharp with no time wasted. Like Thomas, Quelio knows how to keep the game flowing. He keeps control of the dangerous moments and senses trouble before it happens. That is the art of good refereeing. Thomas's refereeing styles have a lot in common. Their lifestyles couldn't be more different. Clive Thomas comes from Triorchy in the Rhondda Valley of South Wales and still exercises in the same field where he first played soccer as a child. He took up refereeing when he was 16 and became the youngest registered referee in Wales. Close by Arnaldo Coelho's apartment in Rio de Janeiro is Copacabana Beach, where like most young cariocas, he started his refereeing career in a black swimsuit like this referee. For his first game, he got paid three bottles of coke. And if the players ever got mad with his decisions, he used to escape from them by running into the sea. Unlike Thomas, who knows the games he's going to referee a month in advance, Coelho is only given a week's notice. Nor do the Brazilian football authorities allow him to referee any major games in Rio. So he travels anything up to 1,500 miles a week to cities like Sao Paulo and Belo Horizonte. This tiring lifestyle is imposed on all referees in Brazil to allay any fears of collusion or corruption. Arnaldo Coelho's name on the program boosts attendance figures of which he gets a percentage. Tonight's match is in Belo Horizonte, where he's a favorite with the local press and television, who treat him as much of a celebrity as the top-ranking players. As senior FIFA referees, both Coelho and Thomas are chosen to officiate at World Cup qualifying matches in many varied locations across the world. So keeping fit, whether it's along the three miles of Copacabana Beach or backwards down the high street in Triorchi, is of vital importance. This is Tehran, the capital of Iran, 18 months before the Shah was deposed and at that time one of the most successful soccer nations in the Middle East. As the national team went through its final training session, 
Clive Thomas and his two Welsh linesmen, Keith Cooper and Donald Bond, flew into Tehran to officiate the 1978 World Cup qualifying match between Iran and Kuwait. Tehran's vast Aramea Stadium was the venue for this match. Through some official oversight, 130,000 tickets were printed for this 100,000-seat stadium. So it was a mad scramble to get in, and if you were lucky, there were still some seats in the golfs. the Iranian and Kuwaiti players understood English, but Thomas left no doubt as to who was in charge. Clive Thomas, it was all in an afternoon's work. Mexico, 1970. Though the atmosphere in Mexico was politically unstable and emotionally highly charged, the 1970 World Cup went off without incident. The Europeans were worried by the high altitude and heat, but Brazil enjoyed playing in conditions admirably suited to them. They were convinced they could win the trophy for the third time. England, the holders, were strong contenders. So were West Germany. And for their superstar, Franz Beckenbauer, Mexico, was a particularly memorable World Cup. But the, the most exciting World Cup was 70 in Mexico. It was a beautiful uh, World Cup. And I never forget in my life the, the, the both games against England. England lead 2-0 and we win in the overtime 3-2. In this seesaw of a match, Beckenbauer's goal helped West Germany to victory. They beat England 3-2 in extra time. We, we uh, played against Italy, the, the, the big game, we lose 4-3 uh, and Italy go to the final. This semi-final between West Germany and Italy was one of the most memorable matches in the Mexico World Cup. Despite the fact that Beckenbauer was fouled and badly hurt, he showed iron will and determination by continuing. West Germany lost 4-3, but nobody will ever forget Beckenbauer's remarkable display of personal courage. Both games are, and, and uh, I never forget in my life. The final between Brazil and Italy was supercharged with excitement and emotion. In his last World Cup appearance, Pele scored Brazil's first goal with a brilliant header. Brazil's exuberance, hard to match at the best of times, floored at least one member of the Italian team. In the second half, Brazil demonstrated that South American style football could beat the defensive European approach. It was 
the destruction of the destroyers. Brazil held the glittering trophy for the third time. FIFA allowed them to keep it forever. Pelé went to France, the world's first ambassador of football. A year later, he retired from the national team, but his career was by no means at an end. Warner Communications, the American entertainment giant, lured Pelé out of retirement to play for the New York Cosmos. His three-year contract was estimated to be worth four and a half million dollars. Almost single-handedly, he launched soccer in the United States. In the summer of 77, Pele's last season in America, the Cosmos were unbeatable. In a round of playoffs for the US Soccer Bowl Championship, here against the Tampa Bay Rowders, the superstar of superstars delighted the crowds with a virtuoso display. Ten days later, the Cosmos beat the Fort Lauderdale Strikers, and Pelly is watched by the biggest crowd ever to see a soccer match in North America, 77,691, and proved why at 36, he was the highest paid footballer on earth. Selling soccer to the American public was a tough job because there was so much competition. As Lee Stern, owner of one of the more successful soccer franchises at the time, the Chicago Sting, explains. We have two baseball teams, the Cubs and the White Sox. We have the Chicago Bears football team. We have the Blackhawks hockey team. We have the Bulls basketball team. We have 16 television stations. Uh, so we really are competing for the entertainment dollar and it makes it very difficult. So soccer was sold as a three-hour piece of entertainment and its players as stars. There were team mascots to appeal to the children in the crowd and shapely cheerleaders to appeal to their dads. And innovations like instant replay so that you can enjoy that great moment once more. Chicago, the action was expertly underscored by a lady on an electronic organ. And behind the scenes in New York, there was an electronic big brother making sure that the home team got the support it deserved. And at halftime, the entertainment was a mini spectacular. October the 1st, 1977, Pele retired from full-time professional soccer. That day, the giant stadium in New York was filled with 70,000 people and a great deal of emotion. Don Dino Do Nascimento, Pele's father, sat beside Muhammad Ali. President Carter was represented by his son, Jeff. And England's Bobby Moore received a warm bear hug from the great man himself. Pele's last salute to the world was typical of the man. The match between New York Cosmos and Santos of Brazil symbolized Pele's long career in soccer. He got his first professional break with Santos and for three years played with the Cosmos. The scoring was symbolic too. 
From a free kick, he rifled home the goal of the match. And the crowd went wild. At half time, Pele took off his number 10 shirt and presented it to his father as a souvenir. Pele finished the match in the white shirt of Santos. An unforgettable day had ended an unforgettable career. Don't be afraid of it, you gotta attack it. After Pele left the cosmos, the American professional Hold soccer on. went into decline. All the way up. But the real legacy Pele left was to inspire Good. youth to take an interest in That's the game. And recent reports show that both in the United ball. States and Canada, Good. soccer Good. is thriving Good. at grassroots level, and that's where it counts. Watch the ball. You too, you're standing flat-footed up on your toes. Move your legs around. Munich, 1974. One of the most memorable moments of this World Cup was the retirement of Sir Stanley Rouse as president of FIFA after 13 years in world soccer's top job. During his presidency, FIFA, based in Zurich, Switzerland, with four soccer confederations already in existence, those of South America, Europe, Asia and Africa, added the American and the Oceania confederations to make their control of international soccer complete. Today, FIFA, with 150 member countries, is truly the United Nations of soccer. In Munich, the newly designed World Cup was to be played for for the first time. In the 1974 finals, Holland, West Germany and Poland were teams who followed Brazil's example and set out to play total football, which means that every player on the field except the goalkeeper is a potential scorer. Several lesser nations reached these finals. Haiti and Zaire, who represented Black Africa for the first time. Even the Australians had a look in but their exits were pretty swift. It was Holland and West Germany, led by Cruyff and Beckenbauer, the two most exciting and dynamic teams who rightly reached the final. The match almost started without corner flags. In all the complex organization, officials had forgotten to mark out the pitch correctly. There were red faces all round. The game itself was a set piece of sheer footballing skill, a perfect example of total football. It kept the biggest TV audience ever, a thousand million, glued to their sets. Within a minute of kickoff, Cruyff was brought down. West Germany equalized through a penalty of their own. Then Muller hit a brilliant winner. West Germany, the host nation, had won the World Cup for the second time. That gave Beckenbauer his greatest personal triumph when he led the West German team to victory in front of thousands of his local Bayern Munich supporters. Beckenbauer had brought the World Cup back home. Having reached the peak of soccer success as a player, Beckenbauer today faces a new challenge as West Germany's national team manager for the World Cup 86 in Mexico. Sir so Stanley Rouse closed the tournament. Many of us, I hope, will meet again in the next World Cup in the Argentina in 1978. Shortly after Munich, FIFA appointed Brazilian millionaire and proud grandfather, Yao Havelange, as its new president a man dedicated to making soccer the number one sport in most, if not all, of FIFA's 150 member countries. To begin to achieve this, in the first years of Havelange's presidency, FIFA launched a version of the World Cup designed specifically to appeal to the professionals of tomorrow. The world's youth teams. Played every two years instead of four, the World Youth Championship was launched in Tunisia in 1977. 
with the jubilant Soviet Union being the first winners. Since then, in the Tokyo Championship of 1979, it has launched at least one young superstar, Argentina's Diego Maradona, on a million dollar professional career. And in Sydney, Australia proved, given the right coaching, even a tiny nation like Qatar in the Middle East can reach the finals. The finals were held in the famous Sydney cricket ground at the beginning of an Australian winter. It wasn't just a downpour, it was a deluge when Qatar met the talented youth team from West Germany in the final. The referee was an Aldo Coelho. The match looked more like water polo than soccer. Conditions hardly helpful to the men from the desert. The Qataris were noticeably unsuccessful in trapping the Germans offside, even though they tried. And in the 85th minute, Anti scored the final goal of the match. West Germany had achieved a resounding victory, 4-0 over Qatar, to become the third world As the 1978 Argentina World Cup approached, in Buenos Aires, they totted up the cost. By the time they had built some new earthquake-proof stadiums, like the one in Mendoza at the foothills of the Andes, which was suspended in a hollow in the ground, and a new TV complex in the smart part of Buenos Aires, also half submerged, but not because of earthquakes, but so it wouldn't become an eyesore to the wealthy residents. The cost of all this looked like being in the region of $500 million. So to earn some of it back, they mounted a huge marketing campaign. Ruled by a military junta at the time, it was a strange sight to see an admiral and a smooth marketing man discussing the merits of the latest batch of souvenirs. But with a possible return of $10 million, it was well worth their effort. Ah, this is a, this is a game, yes. Major manufacturers like Adidas got involved in the action too, and at a lavish reception for a thousand people, launched the official World Cup ball called the Tango, giving it to the football associations of the 16 nations competing. But the men under real pressure were the national team managers, like Argentina's Cesar Luis Minotti, who they nicknamed the artist because of his looks and his interest in the arts. Minotti tried to find a team that would play together as a team, and not, as Argentinian players tend to be, 11 rugged individualists. Argentina was to be Helmut Schoen's fourth World Cup as West Germany's national team manager. In putting a World Cup winning team together, what does he look for in his players? He can be an individualist, but he must bring his individualism uh, in, in the, uh, for, for the team. It is not possible to win a World Cup with 11 Beckenbauers or 11 Bobby Charltons or 11 uh, uh, Pele's. Uh, we must have a good mixture. We must have players who have the, the ideas, and, and, but they must have uh, comrades uh, who can uh, uh, fulfill uh, the, the ideas. While in Rio de Janeiro, at Flamengo, the club he managed before becoming Brazil's national team manager, Claudio Coutinho dropped in to see a young player named Zico who he tipped to become a world star after Argentina 78. Well, Zico is one of uh, the best, maybe the best forward in Brazil, actually. And uh, he's a very interesting kind of player. He's a skillful player, very dangerous around the penalty area. Each time more, he's improving his game by adding something more, like heading and uh, shooting, especially free kicks. He's a specialist in free kicks. He's a very creative player, talented player. I think he's one of the best strikers of Brazil and maybe in the next World Cup he'll become a world star. So what did happen in Argentina 78? 
The first surprise was, despite numerous gloomy forecasts, it began on time. Stadiums complete and TV transmitters working overtime to reach a worldwide audience estimated at over a billion viewers. The following day, France met Italy, and history was made. French forward Bernard Lacan scored the fastest officially recorded goal in the World Cup. When in just 38 seconds, he beat the Italian defence and astounded the world. Ali McLeod's much-publicised Tartan army came to grief at the hands of Peru, the little-publicised South American team. Peru demolished the Scots 3-1 and held Holland to a goalless draw. They turned out to be the team to watch as they got through to the second round, smashing four goals past Iran. After a traumatic beginning in Argentina, including the sending home of Willie Johnson, Scotland managed to settle down and play well, but it was too late. In their match against Holland, they needed to win by three clear goals to stay in the tournament. They got three goals. But unfortunately for the Scots, Holland scored two, suffering their only defeat in the qualifying rounds. Scotland flew back home. West Germany, the cup holders, scored six against Mexico, and on this form looked as though they might repeat their 1974 success. In the second round, they met their opponents from the 74 World Cup final, Poland, but they could only manage a draw. By the time West Germany met Austria, they needed at least five goals to reach the final. Instead, they suffered their only defeat by three goals to two and were out of the World Cup. On June the 21st in Rosario, playing a few hours after Brazil's victory over Poland, Argentina knew that to get to the final, they had to beat Peru by four clear goals. That evening, nobody stirred on the streets of Buenos Aires or Rio, and the world held its breath, as Argentina scored goal after goal. Six in all found their way into the Peruvian net. Argentina, runners-up in the first World Cup, had made it to the final again, 48 years later. On Sunday, June the 25th, 1978, 77,000 people packed the River Plate Stadium for the World Cup final. Both Argentina and Holland were determined not to be runners-up for a second time, but one of them had to be. It took 37 minutes of the first half before Argentina got the goal they wanted. Ardiles slipped a pass through to Luque, who passed to Kempis. He scored with a low shot into the net. Argentina looked nervous as they came onto the field in the second half to face fierce Dutch attacks. The equaliser came in the 81st minute when René van der Kerker placed a fine cross which Kurt Vliet headed into the net. Eight minutes later, Brantz crashed the ball against Villol's right goalpost, but didn't score. The match went into extra time. In the 103rd minute, Holland's dream of winning the cup was shattered when Kempes weaved past three players and shot into the net. The Matador, as he is nicknamed, sent the crowd into a frenzy of delight. But it was really all over when, in the 114th minute, Kempes again made a solo run to put Bertoni through for the final goal of the match. Argentina had become only the sixth country to win the world's most prized sporting trophy. But for all the excitement, Argentina 78 lacked the superstar personalities of previous World Cups. Would Spain 82 be the same? Not if Argentina's 21-year-old Diego Maradona had anything to do with it. Rumor had it that he was the greatest player since Pelé. To find out, we followed Maradona to Tokyo, where he and his team, Boca Juniors, were on a three-match tour. Their tour manager explained how many were in Maradona's group. The group is 25 or 26, including the players and the officials. But this time, uh, a total of 
58 persons came in from Buenos Aires, including followers and uh, newspaper men and whatever. Even millionaire soccer stars still need their mums to button them up. The tranquil calm of the famous Golden Pavilion in Kyoto was soon to be shattered by the Maradona Circus. Maradona brought his father, mother, two brothers, one sister, uh, his uh, girlfriend, <laughs> and also Maradona has his own production company, and his uh, manager and two persons working for them came to three of them. What, we wondered, was it going to cost the Japanese organizers to play Maradona and the Boca Juniors team? Three games in Japan uh, will cost almost uh, four or five hundred thousand dollars. And that's a lot of money for three games only. Was Maradona worth it? Well, a crowd of 40,000 turned up to see Japan's national team play Boca Juniors and sample a little of Maradona magic firsthand. As Maradona sped to his next match in Japan, he could relax. The tour was highly successful. But what lay ahead in Spain when the world at large was to see him for the first time? In 1982, the largest ever World Cup opened in Barcelona. Maradona, under a million pound contract to Barcelona, was marked from the start. Minotti, who'd given up smoking, started smoking again, after Argentina lost 1-0 to Belgium and 3-0 to Brazil. And when, with a vicious foul, Maradona got sent off the field, it was easier in Japan. Cameroon surprised everybody by remaining undefeated in three matches, even drawing with Italy. Kuwait threatened to quit the World Cup after a controversy over the fourth goal in their match with France. But the prince pacified them and lost a minute's worth of his income when he had to pay a £5,000 fine for his interference. Britain was represented by three teams, Scotland, Northern Ireland and England. The host nation in the World Cup stands a good chance of winning, but the rot set in and Spain lost 1-0 to Northern Ireland, who fielded the youngest ever World Cup player, 17-year-old Norman Whiteside. Scotland just wasn't a match for the cup favourites, Brazil. And England's Brian Robson scored the fastest ever World Cup goal, 27 seconds after kickoff against France. But England's Brooking and Keegan, both suffering from injuries, couldn't play until the team's last match against Spain. Although they were undefeated in all five matches, England didn't qualify and retired gracefully. Brazil, flamboyant and skillful, looked the favourites, but Italy's Rossi scored three goals to Brazil's two. Brazil was up and Italy was on the way up. Poland and Italy met in the semi-final. Rossi scored both the Italian goals to beat Poland 2-0.
who was voted the man of the match. France reached the semi-final with Germany and surprised everybody, forcing a 3-3 draw by the end of extra time. West Germany earned the right to play Italy in the final by beating France in a match that ended in sudden death. Despite royalty, presidents and an enthusiastic 95,000 crowd, the first half of the final was dull. Fouls dominated goals. Until, in the 56th minute, Rossi scored for Italy. Tardelli scored their second goal. Conti made it a resounding 3-0 for Italy. Brighton scored for West Germany, but he was too late, and Italy became the world champions for the third time. Vive la football!